Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know what time it is at your end, but whatever time it is, this is the day of the night that the good God of heaven has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for joining us on our broadcast for today. Please stay where you are. Get ready for God to really impact your life with his truth. The word for today is a very powerful passage of scripture where we're going to draw out lessons that we can learn from the life of, guess who? A leper. Yes. Lessons from the life of a well-known leper. There are so many powerful lessons to learn from the story of this man. It's been a blessing to me, and I believe it will be a blessing to you also. Who is he, you ask? Hold on. Momentarily, I'll be telling you who this leper was. Please stay where you are. Get ready to be blessed. I don't want you alone partaking of this blessing. I'm sure you have friends. I'm sure you have neighbors that you will love to see blessed. Simple thing, give them a call or share the link to the platform you are listening to us on or you are watching us on because everyone deserves to be part of this. Now, while you do that, let me just go ahead and make my usual announcements. There's a few who are regular on this program, you know what those announcements are. But grant me the indulgence of doing that for the sake of those who are not aware of it. The first we always talk about is our podcast, Bishop Etiola's podcast. You can access that podcast by downloading my podcast app on the Google Play Store. For those of you who use the Android phone, or you can listen directly on the Spreaker app, which can be downloaded for both the Android and the Apple phones. Spreaker is spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. -E -E By the way, you can listen to us on any and every podcast provider. I think they have an arrangement among themselves where they share their broadcast. And I think that is very helpful to little guys like us. Come and join listeners from over 50 countries around the world that have downloaded over 132,000 episodes. I implore you to please check us out. If you have not, you're going to be blessed for doing so. And don't forget to help us tell others too about our presence on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. And of course, on TV. Yes, we're on TV in all Caribbean island countries. We're on TV in Guyana, on the giant TV 13, RBS is a station name. In Guyana, every Saturday we're there from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. That is local time. I want to thank those who are watching us right now in all 23 Caribbean island countries through the great Mercy and Truth TV in Jamaica. We're on there every Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 local time and every Wednesday morning at 1.30 a.m. local time. I pray that God's blessing will be upon the owners of those stations and those that work there too, good people. I hope to meet you all one day. And of course, we we'll pray for the great countries of Jamaica and Guyana and all the countries in the Caribbean island. May God give you peace and may God give you prosperity. Please don't forget to join us also on our own radio station, Fresh Waves Radio. It is on 24-7. And on that station, you can listen to a variety of programming that's been a blessing to many people around the world. Fresh Waves Radio. You can go ahead and download the app for both the Android and the Apple phones. 
from their respective app stores. Just type in Fresh Waves Radio, install the app, you are good to go. And if you want to listen to us on your computer, just go www.freshwavesradio.com and scroll down a little bit and you will see the word listen. Click on listen and you are on the air. God bless you as you join us this day and every day. We also are on the air praying every Thursday and every Friday at 7 p.m. New York time live on my Facebook page and also on our other internet handles. God's been blessing people. Wow. You know how they say trial will convince you? Come try it. You're going to be blessed for joining us this Thursday, this Friday, for a life-changing experience praying at the throne of mercy. Now those are my announcements as usual. Let's go and announce our presence to God for him to help us today. Father, we are here. Without you, we can do nothing. Please, anoint me to speak and bless your people mightily. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I'm reading 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, the 14th verse all the way down to verse 19. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his entourage, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. I'm smiling because I'm going to make a big deal out of that statement. Let me read it to you again. But Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? Earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering or sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when thy, my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. When I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, aha, uh -huh, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Now we're using for our text a passage of scripture that is generally and popularly used by preachers to preach the salvation message. I remember the first time I ever preached on this passage, my theme was the two giants. I remember that it was a village evangelism we went for in Africa, and they gave me the platform that night to preach. Oh, what a great night that was. And my sermon, the two giants, sin and sickness. You know, in this passage, leprosy preachers always likened to sin. And the cleansing of Naaman is always likened to how a sinner can be cleansed from his sin or her sin. You know, God has used this very graphic story many, 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 many times 
to bring many, many sinners to Christ. But after the sinner is saved, he becomes what we call the new convert. This passage of scripture is not only appropriate to be used for bringing sinners to Christ, but it is equally appropriate to be used to teach new converts about how to walk with God. The passage also goes a step further to teach the gospel minister how to handle converts and Christians as a whole. So if you're a convert, whether young or old, there is good instruction in this passage of scripture for you. Very, very, very good instruction in this passage of scripture for you if you are a young convert. Now, if you are in any leadership role in the church, listen to this, there is instruction for you there also. So converts to Christ, they need to be taught. And those who are leading the people of God, they need to be taught. And both of them can find sound teaching inside this passage that we just read. You're going to be blessed today. Just come along with me and see the deep things of the Lord that we can just bring out of this scripture that we just read. The first thing is very simple, and that is this. Converts, new believers, need to be taught against superstitious beliefs. Did you hear that? Converts to Christ, they need to be taught against superstitious beliefs. Look at what Naaman, the new convert, said in verse 17. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burning of earth? Wait a minute, Mr. Naaman, what are you talking about? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering or sacrifice unto any other gods, but unto the Lord. So what are you doing with two mules burden of earth? So they should go dig the ground, get some earth into some containers, put them on two mules, and you take them home. For what? What was his motive? Or what was his purpose in proposing this to Elisha. Well, it could be one of several superstitions. The Bible is silent about it. Well, let me tell you some superstitions of those days. There was a very common superstition at that time, and it might have brought into the superstition that God can only be acceptably worshipped on his own soil, <laughs> right? God can only be acceptably worshipped on his own soil. That is, no God could be worshipped in a proper and acceptable manner except in his own land or upon an altar built of the earth and the sand and the soil of his own land. So he said, let me just take two uh, mules loads of sand with me. And I know I've taken the God of Israel with me. Superstition. But it could also be that he wished that when he was far away from the Jordan to have the earth of Palestine to rob himself with. And the Orientals used that as a substitute to water. In fact, someone was telling me some people do that in Africa too. When they go to some special rivers, they take the soil of the river and rub it on themselves instead of soap. It's very interesting, very interesting. Or maybe another superstition this man had was the superstition that the Jews and the Muslims had uh, revolving around having a portion of the holy earth for nightly pillow. Can you believe that? You take a portion of the earth in the Holy Land and put it under your pillow. We can't say 
we can't say. But whatever it is, whatever his reasons are, they are all superstitious. Superstition still abounds still today. And there are many, many common superstitious beliefs that are floating around, even in Christian circles today. One of them is that you must not have a dead clock around your house. I don't know why. So your battery must never die. You must not have a dead clock around your house. Wow. Another is that you must not have a cracked mirror in your house. If the mirror in your house is cracked, it's not good. Who says? Well, there are more. Another superstition is that you must not wear a cloth inside out around people. That if you wear, like this, my little jacket here, if I wore it inside out, many people believe that all the blessings of the people that I come across, I will uh, harvest them and they will become mine. Can you believe that superstition? Well, there are many. There's another one that nail clippings must not be left just anywhere. Well, maybe, maybe because it's unhealthy, but it's a superstitious belief. There's another one that is very strong in Africa and many Christians believe in it, that a pregnant woman must not go out at noonday or in the middle of the night because they feel that spirits go around during midday and in the night and they can jump into your baby and drive your baby out. Superstitions all over the place. There's another one that someone wearing, someone that is not wearing a shoe must not point the bottom of his or her bare foot towards you. <laughs> Another superstition. I even read one today. I was really surprised. Never heard this before. This is an American superstition, though, that you don't open an umbrella inside your house. So you get out to open the umbrella, not inside the house, or else this may happen or that may happen. Have you ever had the superstition that you eat beans on January 1st? I used to hear that when I was down south. And many people still do it till today. They will not eat any food that does not contain beans on 1st of January. Superstition, superstition, superstition. Naaman had his own. He wanted to carry the land, the sand, and the soil in the land to his own country. What was the reason? Maybe when we get to heaven, we'll find out from him. Do you know there are even churches, churches that teach these sometimes occultic superstitions and it's part of their doctrine. And you go into a church like that and you hear it and you see it and you wonder where did they get this from? It's all rooted in superstition. There's a church I know of. Every member of that church must wear the photograph of the founder around his or her neck and in their homes. So if you open up their necks, you'll find it there. And if you go into their homes, you'll find it there. Superstitions. And another church, there is a way you have to greet members of that church. And they are not occultic. No, 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 no. They are just close to being occultic. And it's so sad that Superstition has been imported into the church. I know of another church that believes that when you wear a particular apron that is sold in the church, you can never be involved in an accident. So when you want to travel in a plane, in an airplane, or you want to travel on your own car, on your public transportation, you put on that apron, you wear it on top of whatever you have on and you'll never have an accident. They even believe that if per chance you are shot, the bullet can never penetrate your flesh because the apron <laughs> will act as protection, bulletproof vest. And it is nothing but 
cotton. Up to today, there are still churches too where men and women must sit separately. Another superstition. I don't know what happens, why men and women cannot sit together in a church, but there are churches that believe that very strongly. And if you go, you want to violate that, it's going to be trouble for you. I said something when we started my own church, Fresh Anointing. I told the people on the day of the inauguration, I said, listen, we're not going to believe in superstitions in this church. Where the Bible is silent, we're going to be silent. And where the Bible is loud, we're going to be loud. And where the Bible is not clear, we will be unclear. Anything different from that is a slippery slope. So that's the first thing I say here, superstition. Teach your new convert that all the superstitions they brought, they brought in in their belief system, they need to drop them at the foot of the cross and stand in the liberty whereby Christ has set them free. But there's a le second lesson from the life of Naaman that converts need to be diligently and carefully taught. And it's in verse 18 of that passage of scripture that we read. This is what it says. Look at what Naaman said, people. Naaman said, In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow my, listen now, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. He said, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. What? Looking at that passage, what are the things we must teach young converts with great clarity? Well, the first thing I see here very clearly is that the new convert must abstain from all appearance of evil. The new convert must be taught. And I think I taught this about two weeks ago. The new convert must abstain from all appearance of evil. Listen, if his profession will make him offend God, he should take his stand and tell those who employed him that I'm sorry, my loyalty to God requires me not to do this or not to do that, or else he should go ahead and change his profession. That is what new converts need to be taught. And that's what the Bible teaches, by precepts and by examples. Let me show you what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Reading there in verse number 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, Uncle Naaman. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols, Mr. Naaman? Once you get born again, you don't go to the house of an idol, talk less bowing down with your master. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch, touch not the unclean thing. Don't go to the house of Rimon. It's an unclean place. They worship idols there. God said, don't touch an unclean thing, and I, your father, will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Very clear. I don't need to pass any comment on that. Go to the words of Jesus in a sermon on the mount 
in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 to 30. If thy right eye offend thee, Mr. Naaman, newly converted Naaman, uh, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So we need to teach our converts that you need to abstain from all appearance of evil. I know, Naaman, you are not going there to worship Raimon, but you are going with your boss. And if your boss bows down, you are now seeking for permission to bow down too. Yeah, in your heart, you are not bowing down. In your appearance, you are bowing down. That is wrong appearance. So Jesus made it clear and Paul the Apostle made it clear also, you don't do that, Mr. Naaman, when you get back home. If your profession, my friend watching me today or listening to me today, if you're in your profession, you must make a stand for God. No compromise. You know, many years ago in Montgomery, Alabama, I had no job. And the pastor of the church that I was attending was concerned. So he talked to someone that uh, managed a, a restaurant and uh, they gave me a job. I didn't even apply for it. He just said, come resume tomorrow. I went there and I saw that they were serving alcohol. And that would be one of the things I would be doing as an employee of that place. I told the man, I said, I need the money but I can't do this. And that was how I never took that job. I can go on and on and on. If your profession will make you sin against God, you see that you make a stand and tell them, exempt me from this, or you quit and God will honor you and provide for you. Did God honor me? Oh, he did. Did God provide for me? Yes, he did. Take a stand. No compromise, like Mr. Daniel. No compromise, like the three Hebrew children. In fact, I'm going to read to you their inspiring stories in the book of Daniel. You know it, but I still want to read it to drive in my point. It's a rather long passage of scripture, but believe me, it's worthy to be read because the word of God is more important than the commentary that I can make. Come with me to Daniel chapter one, verse five. It says the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. And mark you now, the king's meat is always offered to an idol. The king's meat is always sacrificed to an idol. Then after that, it's served to the people. It's something everybody knows. So they were offered a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. It is believed that by eating the meat of the, uh, the, the king and drinking the wine of the king, they will come out looking better when it's all said and done. Now look at what Daniel did. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, and he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and unto Hananiah of Shadrach, and of Mishael, uh, Meshach, and of Azariah Abednego. Now, look at the faithfulness of Daniel. Look at his refusal to compromise. Look at him in verse 8. But Daniel, I wish Naaman will do this. But Naaman, uh -uh, he didn't. He said, I'm going to go there and bow down. But Daniel purpose in his heart. And this thing has to do with your heart. You got to make up your mind. You got to count the cost. But Daniel purpose in his heart that he will not. 
defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I think that's one of the problems we have. We feel that if we request, we will be turned down. But Daniel requested, and amazingly, he found favor. He was not turned down. He said, all the compromise that you are compromising is because you don't have enough faith to ask. They make you work on Sundays, and you've missed church now for months. Why don't you ask for an exemption? You say, oh, they won't give it to you. They've never given it to anybody. You will be the first that they will give it to. Look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Do you see that? God can give you favor with those who will allow you to serve God with a clean, clear conscience. Now let's read verse 10. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse, worse like him than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then Daniel said to Melza, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days. Say, so we don't even need three years. Isn't it is beautiful? We don't need three years. We need just ten days. Let them give us pause to eat and water to drink. And let our countenances be looked upon before thee. And the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's maid. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them just 10 days. Guess what happened in verse 15? At the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. I want to scream and shout hallelujah because when you make a stand for God, God will stand by you and God will make a stand for you. This man refused to compromise on his friends these people refused to do what is wrong and they did not want anything to do with appearance of evil. But guess what happened? God backed them up. So Naaman didn't have any excuse, really. Uh, if he had gone to his boss and said, boss, uh, I just went to uh, the prophet in Samaria and uh, the, the, the man did a great work in my life. I'm healed, I'm well, and, and I promised him I'm going to serve his God. And part of serving his God means not serving your God. Could you still let me be your general but have nothing to do with your God? You will be surprised what the king might have said to Naaman. Now, let's see the, the fairy funnies. And let's see a stand that these children took in Daniel chapter 3 <clears throat> in verse number 8. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down, and worshipeth that he should be cast into the midst of a bonny fairy furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. This man, O king, have not regarded thee at all. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is it true? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now I'm giving you another chance. 
If ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fairy furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. That's what Naaman should have gone back to his land ready to do. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace, and he would deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the former's visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that he should hit the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fairy furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their horses, and their hats, and their other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walk in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fairy furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst, out of the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whom whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was an hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god. Did you hear that, Brother Naaman? Except their own god. If Naaman had stood his ground, God would have taken the glory. And who knows, the king might have said something like this. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, every nation, every language, which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So what happened after that? The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Isn't that beautiful? So Naaman did not need to tell Elisha that when I get back home, I will still have to go into the uh, idol house of my boss 
and I'll still have to bow down, and I hope God will pardon me when he sees me bowing down for an idol. No, teach young converts that you stand your ground for Christ after you give your life to Jesus. The third passage is also equally long, and I'm not going to bother reading it because you all know well. You all know it very well. It's connected to Daniel. His co-workers conspired against him because he excelled above them. And they made a rule that nobody must ask any God anything for a couple of days except the king. They knew this guy cannot play with prayer. They know he could not abandon prayer. So they got the king to sign a decree, no prayer, except to the king. Well, when he knew the writing was signed, the decree was signed, he went in and prayed like other times. And of course, these people were watching him and they dragged him before the king. The king loved Daniel, but he couldn't save himself, nor save Daniel. But God of Daniel was there to save him. So they threw him into the lion's den. And you know what happened. The lions became his pillow overnight. The king could not sleep. He came in the morning, found Daniel alive, brought him out. And the people that conspired against him were thrown into the lion's den. Glory to God. And guess what happened? I believe a revival broke out. God delivered him. Listen, you don't have to compromise. You don't have to plan to do wrong in order to keep your job. If what they're asking you to do is wrong, Stand your ground and say, I'm sorry, I cannot, I will not, I must not. And God will be honored in your life because he will back you up. Well, suppose they fire you. The same thing the children, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said, God will serve, is able to deliver us. And even if he doesn't deliver us, we are not going to do what you told us to do. Ooh, some people love God. And I pray I will be one of them. And I pray you will be one of them. That you will make a stand for God on your job, in your family, in your church, wherever you go. That others may, I will not. I will not do that which is wrong. All right? So the new convert, like Naaman, <clears throat> who have now said to Elisha, I'm going to be serving your God henceforth. The new convert must know that he or she has to take a stand for God and never compromise the faith. Daniel never did. The three Hebrew children never did. And you can do it too, refusing to compromise. But there's yet another lesson from this story of Naaman. I told you his story is loaded, loaded with lessons. And the lesson, again, is simply this. The doctrine of indulgence is not of God. I'll explain in a minute. But let me say that again. The doctrine of indulgence is not of God. What do I mean by doctrine of indulgence? That we may do evil, that good may come out of it that the end sanctifies the means. So even if the means is wrong, if the end is good, the good end has purified the bad means. Uh-uh. It's not allowed. There are people who do anything for political purposes. They say you can do unlawful acts to get a job, to get a position in politics, and to rise on the job. Uh-uh. The end never justifies the means. What do I mean by this? <laughs> this man called Naaman did something in this passage that is unbelievable. You know what it was? He said, if I go, and I know I will, and I go with my boss 
and I know I will. And he leans on me, and I know he will. And he bows down, and I bow down, because I know I will. He said, may God forgive me that sin. He knew it was wrong. He said, may God forgive me that sin. You know what I say there? <laughs> you don't confess sins before you commit them. Can I repeat myself? You don't confess sins before you commit them. It's a mockery of God if you go that route. As a new convert, wrong is wrong, right is right. So don't go to God and say, God, what I'm about to do is wrong, but I don't have a choice. Please forgive me that I'm going to do it. You know, I used to have a guy in my church here in New York, and um, he was to do something that was very bad, and he knew it was very bad. And he told me, he said, Bishop, I just told myself, and I told God, God, this thing I'm about to do, I know is wrong, but I don't have a choice. I'm between a rock and a hard place, so you just have to forgive me. I'm going to do it and um, I'm still your own, uh, please forgive me that I'm going to do it. When he told me that, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I just shook my, my head. A new convert doesn't do that. Not to even talk about someone who was a worker in the church. Don't do it. If you're strong, don't do it. Don't just say, Lord, I'm sorry that I have to do this thing. I hope you find it in your heart to forgive me because to do it, I must. Don't do it. But there's another lesson. As a new convert, and you need to listen to this very well, as a new convert to Christianity, don't assume that you know. Don't. You ask questions from those that know. You know what Naaman did here? He was not asking questions. He was making a statement. Can I repeat that? Nehemiah was not asking a question. Nehemiah was making a statement. He was saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I hope God forgives me. What are the advantages and disadvantages of this man going back to the idol house with his boss? You know, this man could easily have relapsed into idolatry easily this man will be setting a very very bad example before others who are of the same faith you have said now you are worshiping the god of israel the god of elisha and then you are saying these are the things i'm going to do so what what a bad example you are setting by going into the house of an idol did you know you can easily relapse into idolatry that you live rejected when you went to Elisha. It degrades the conscience. When you do that which is wrong again and again and again, it degrades your conscience and it weakens your moral power and it hampers spiritual aspirations. But he went ahead and did it. He never asked him any question. I mean, a young convert should have asked someone like Elisha, Elisha, this is what's going to happen when I get back home. What do I do? What do I not do? How do I go about it? I know I don't worship is wrong. I don't need anyone to preach that to me. When I go back home, I'm still going to occupy this position. How do I navigate myself? He never asked any question. He just made a pure statement. I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. I hope God forgives me. Let me not talk to the preachers because we are done with Naaman. Let's go to the preachers. In verse 18, he said in this thing, Lord, pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on his hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. You know what Elisha just said to him? Elisha said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. I wanted to learn some serious wisdom here, preachers and leaders that are watching me right now. Elisha never commented on his statement. Did you notice that? 
When he said all that he said in verse 18 and in verse 19, Elisha just said, so long, goodbye. Two major lessons to learn here before we go off the air today. You don't answer questions that you are not asked. That's number one. Number two, you don't offer counseling that you are not sought. The earlier we learn that as leaders, the better. You don't preach a sermon to a congregation that you are not offered a pulpit and a microphone to. Be quick to hear, but be slow to speak. It is not in everything, listen, it is not in every situation that you have to give an opinion, even when you disagree. I repeat, it's not in everything, it's not in every situation that you give an opinion, even when you disagree. You say, is that true? Let me show you in the life of Christ. In John chapter 12, an incident took place in verse 3, all the way down. Listen to it, let me read it. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the whole house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, that is Judas Iscariot, now look at him speaking, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? Why? Why this waste? Now look at the commentary of the Holy Spirit and the commentary of John, who wrote this book. Then this he said, that is this Judas said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then Jesus spoke. But amazingly, let me read what Jesus said. Then said Jesus, let I alone against the day of my bearing as she kept this, for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Do you notice something there? Jesus never commented on what Judas said. He never said a word. If I were Jesus, I would have said, oh, what he said is not true. He's a thief. That's why he said what he said. Jesus just kept quiet, ignored what he said completely. Wow. It was uh, John, when he was writing this book, that said, yes, he said that because he was a thief. Jesus never said a thing. It's not everything you hear that you comment on. But there's a second lesson before we pray. And it is that for those who do not know as much as you do, all right, it's for those who do not know as much as you do. It is not everything you say to them in a single day. You may destroy them in the process. Did you hear what I said? Those who don't know as much as you do, it is not everything you know that you say to them on a single day. Look at what happened in John chapter 16, two verses, 12 and 13. Jesus said, look at the master now, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Wow! Did you realize that if you read that, you will think, oh, Jesus was afraid of these disciples. Jesus compromised. Why did Jesus not tell them everything they needed to know? Why did, and those of us who are really spiritual will say, what about if they died and went, and, and went to hell? But the Bible says, Jesus said to them, there are many things I have to tell you, but you cannot handle them now. There are many things, many things is there that I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So later you will hear them, later you will know them. Maybe that was the strategy that Elisha used for Naaman. Said, this guy just got saved today. This guy just came to know the Lord today. He will learn these things over time. The Spirit of God will walk on him over time. And he just kept quiet. 
It's not everything you know that you say. You may destroy people in the process. All right? If Jesus did it, I think you can do it too. I wish I had more time to teach this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time. But I hope you learned some good lessons from the life of Naaman in his interaction with Elisha. If you're a convert, there are lessons there for you. If you're a minister, there are lessons there for you. If you're a church leader, there are lessons there for you. May the Lord make us doers of the word and not hearers only. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me pray for you as we go off the air. Father, I thank you for our friends that are patiently waited with us to learn the word of God today. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Bring us back again next week as we study around your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week, God willing. Until then, bye-bye.